I'm very happy to chat with you about biology always, but I thought maybe you'd be interested to find out how I actually started with this whole biology gambit. Um, when I finished my school, it was very clear to me that I wanted to study biology. I enjoyed biology all my school life, and um, that, that wasn't really a difficult um, decision to make. Um, I didn't really have a, a clear understanding of where a science degree with a biology major would get me, and I wasn't particularly concerned about that. Um, what um, I did realize as an, as an undergraduate is that I really enjoyed uh, research. And so when I finished my undergraduate degree, it was also clear to me that I wanted to continue research and go in to do a PhD. When I finished my PhD, um, I was lucky to get a, a salaried position for about three, four years as a postdoc. And that just means um, you can do a lot of research in a very short amount of time at a university. And that postdoc was actually um, in, in Melbourne. The, the PhD that I did was in, in Austria at the University of Vienna. I'm originally from Austria, so um, that was good. And while I was doing my postdoc, then this um, advertising came up about a lectureship at Macquarie University, and I kind of went, oh yeah, I'll give that a go. And that was back in 2001, and so I've been at Macquarie University since then. And these days I've taken on a little bit more uh, responsibility in terms of being a head of department or currently I'm the chair of academic senate. And when you look at that sort of flowchart, you almost think that back when I was an undergraduate, um, I had this vision, you know, I, I knew this is where I want to be. A, one day I want to become a, a chair of academic senate. Um, but the reality, and so it looks like this was my path, you know, very clear ahead. I knew exactly where I was going. I knew exactly how I was going to get there. But it wasn't really quite like that. Um, as an undergraduate, I was really a mediocre student. Um, I didn't do particularly well in first year. It took me really quite a while to get the hang of university, to um, to get the discipline. You know, I had to you know I had to arrange myself. There was no one going to tell me what I need to do. But what I did understand in my undergraduate that I really enjoyed research. Um, that when I chose my my postgraduate, my PhD. Um, for me, the, the really important thing then was to go back to Austria and live in Austria for a little while. So that, that was the, the prime motivator of where I chose to do my PhD. And the reality is I didn't do a very exciting research topic. It was still on spiders. I always work on spiders. But it wasn't, I wouldn't say it was earth-shattering research that I was doing, but it was very pleasant. I had a lot of fun in Austria. But the other thing I understood during my PhD is that what, what the currencies of, of um, working in science, and that was to publish papers, to travel, um, and to have ideas. And about, I, I spent about a year after my PhD to write my papers and to apply for these postdoc um, positions. And then I got one. As I said, I got this postdoc in Melbourne. And in that postdoc, I obviously got my act together and I've kind of made up for sort of a low impact PhD. Um, but I did enjoy my PhD. I don't want to complain at all. I had a great time. And in that postdoc, I sort of really focused and then learned a lot of publication skill. When it came to applying for my lectureship, I, I think it was, um, I was just uh, the combination of the right person at the right time. You know, they were just happened to be looking for me. Um, I had a relatively strong research record, uh, record at the time, but I think what also came out in my interview and in my application was I was really willing to contribute. I was going to be very happy to chip in in a department and, and be a good citizen. Um, I gained a lot of skills over the years and, and that realized, or I realized that um, I, I, I'm actually well organized and I'm willing to contribute and I'm willing um, to, to lead and, and convince people. And so positions like head of department or chair of academic senate uh, became a possibility. But the reality is with all this is throughout my entire career, this is what my path at any one stage always looked like. It was just really just the immediate that I was fairly sure of 
but and so I just went from one opportunity to the next and I maybe, maybe it's callous but I was never really um, worried that maybe there's nothing around the bend I just thought you know because I'm I love the stuff that I do so much something will come up so I, I had a very sort of a laid-back approach to not very structured approach to my career so that's a bit, bit of a snapshot of, of how I got to where I am now. I still do a bit of research, but I do a lot of work for the university as well. But what I, what I'm, oh, I forgot about this slide. This is, this is what I think helped me in, in this whole period and still helps me. I, I just focus on what I enjoy. And in the end, that's research, that's teaching. And I also enjoy contributing to sort of a bigger picture. I also have a good understanding of what's required, so I'm very realistic. I know what it takes to be reasonably successful, so whether that's writing research papers, having ideas, travel, contributing at a department at a university level. And I'm, I'm very patient. I can sit things out, you know, I can just wait for the right stuff to come my way, so I don't panic uh, usually. So that's, that's I think, that's, that's worked for me. Everyone has different things, uh, but this was, I think, my perfect recipe. All right. Uh, and if you have questions about that, I think we get to, to that. We can talk about that later. But the, the, what I've been invited to talk to you about is where do biological discoveries come from? You know, how do we, how do we discover things? And I, I just want to give you just a, a few seconds in your head to think about, well, what biological discoveries do you know of? Can you immediately think up in your head? Let's give you a couple of seconds to go into the depth of your memory. And I've just, I've got a couple of examples that maybe some of you have come up with. Penicillin, right? Uh, a, a, a very significant discovery, um, s saved and is saving millions of lives. Of course, the other very important biological discovery in our in the last century is, is just the discovery of DNA. So, um, so these are significant discoveries. They've changed the way we understand biology. They've changed our lives. But where should we look for future biological discoveries? Is there a is there a roadmap? Is there something pointing to where we should be? discovering things. Well, maybe, maybe this is what we should be looking at. This is the naked mole rat, and it's possibly the, the world's most unattractive animal. It, um, it's naked, it has no hair, it lives in Africa, it digs tunnels, it's got this giant teeth that it uses to um, unearth their tunnels. Um, they're very, very interesting creatures. Um, these teeth are actually outside the mouth, so they don't get their mouth full of earth while they're digging. They forage on roots, underground roots, and they're very interesting for evolutionary biologists such as I because they live in a society very much like bees or ants live. So what you see here is sitting at top is the queen. So there's only one reproductive female in the colony, and she's the only female who is allowed to reproduce. Um, if she finds another female secretly reproducing, she will actually go and kill her. So she controls that whole colony. She is lying on top of workers, and the workers are not allowed to reproduce, and they must work. They must dig tunnels, they must bring food, they must clean the colony. So from a evolutionary biology perspective, they are hugely interesting. But what is also extremely interesting about them is that they are seemingly resistant to cancer. So this is the cover of a, of a journal. It, the journal is called Nature. It's a very prestigious scientific journal. And the naked mole rat has made it into nature. So this is a discovery that naked mole rats do not develop cancer. They live for an extraordinary long time, 80, 60, 80 years. And it's really only the size of a little mouse. Um, if you compare their lifespan to mice, mice maximally live three to four years, and that's on the best conditions. And these creatures just live 
as they, they get as old as we do. So, and the reason why they live for so long is they don't get cancer. They just don't die of the classic old age disease that also affects humans, and that's cancer. And how did we discover this? How did we discover that, that, that this is perhaps a really interesting um, organism to study the biology of cancer? It was a pure coincidence. Um, zookeepers, evolutionary biologists such as I, were just observing these animals out of their, out of their natural history um, interest. They weren't looking for making discoveries in cancer, but they obviously noticed that these, the animals are just living forever. And so once this knowledge, this natural history knowledge, um, became available, cancer researchers started asking questions about it. So why aren't they getting cancer? Of course, the, the animal that we use for cancer research, that's the mouse. So the mouse is the classic cancer uh, study organism. So a lot of research goes into studying cancer in the mouse as a model for the human to understand how cancer cells reproduce, how they travel through the body, how other cells react to cancer cells, how the immune system reacts to the cancer cell. All of that is done on the mouse. And a huge amount of effort goes into studying cancer in the mouse. And here's just a, a diagram that shows you the number of research papers published between 94 and 2013 on cancer in the mouse. And as you can see in 2012 and 2013, that was halfway 2013, you know, over 500 papers, research papers published on cancer in the mouse. So that is a huge amount of effort. That's a huge amount of people, money going into studying cancer in the mouse. And this concept of pouring a lot of energy, a lot of focus, research focus, in a single species is very common in science. And it's, it's called the use of using model species. And we have in, in animal science, we have four big models. We have the worm, C. elegans. We have the mouse, we've just met the mouse. We have the fish, zebrafish. And we have the fly, fruit fly. And they are model species. There's a lot of research that goes on understanding more and more and more in greater detail about these animals. Big bucks. I uh, don't want to leave the plant people out. This is the plant model. This is Arabidopsis. So in laboratories, universities, hospitals around the world, researchers are using these organisms just a handful of organisms to do most of their research. And the value of this, the value of focusing your research just on a few species is huge. Here's an example. This is a paper also published in Nature recently um, that looks at identifying the neurons that are responsible for this fruit fly to stick out its tongue. This is a response to sugar, and the tongue, well, it's its mouth parts, that's where the black arrow is. So in response to sugar, the, the fruit fly will extrude, just stick out its mouth parts, its tongue. And we know so much about fruit flies. So much research has been going on that they have identified that there is two neurons, two brain cells that control this response. And the power of this, the power of knowing so much about a single species, about each brain cell, about each gene, about the physiology, is invaluable. Absolutely invaluable. But it doesn't matter. But there's, there's one assumption that this approach makes. yeah. And the assumption is that if you study the mouse, or the fly, or the worm, then you know about the biology of all animals. You don't need to study the other animals. You just need to focus on one, and what you find there is probably applicable to the others. And with the example that I gave earlier about 
naked mole rats, the comparison of the naked mole rats with the mouse, you can easily see that this assumption is not um, always true. In fact, it is rarely true. So it didn't really matter how closely and how, much, how many millions of dollars you spent in the mouse looking for cancer resistance, you would never find it there because it's not there. So in order to discover cancer resistance, you actually have to look somewhere else. And that's, and that's really the balance that's currently um, in place with research. We have to balance um, our resources. Funding bodies need to balance our resources. Governments need to balance resources. Where are we going to spend money for research? So we have to um, balance whether we're going to pour a lot of energy, questions, resources, people into studying just a few species, but in great detail, or whether we should go out and study the many, 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 many species that are either understudied or literally not studied at all. And see what sort of discoveries we can make there that we can't possibly make with our model species because they just have a different biology. So the bottom line really is that um, we need to balance this. When we want to make discoveries, we need to balance between what we already know and how much, how much more detail we can get from what we already know to making wild and new discoveries. And maybe discoveries that are not particularly focused because there's a lot of chance observations. I've had a great opportunity in studying some of Australia's unstudied, understudied species. Um, I'm a behavioral ecologist, I like to look at behavior. And here you can see a pair of Queensland tree mantids. Um, you find them on running up and down trees in, in mid and northern Queensland. And here you have a mating pair, the smaller male is on top. And we've studied their behavior, we've studied their morphology. We have looked at uh, spiders. This is my favorite spider. This is the St. Andrew's cross spider. It's very common in Sydney. The very large individual is the female. The tiny, tiny, tiny one is the male. Um, females are sexually cannibalistic, which means they um, attack and eat the male during or after mating. So that's a very interesting behavior to me. And I like to answer questions or ask questions about why this behavior occurs. But spiders are not the only ones uh, that are sexually cannibalistic. We have praying mantids here in Sydney even that are cannibalistic. So here we have a large female in the green and on top of her is the male in brown without a head. So she's already uh, grabbed him, she's already chewed his head off and when he finishes copulation she'll eat the rest of him. I know there's an urban myth about that the female must decapitate the male for copulation to be successful. I'd like to reassure you that's not necessary. He is perfectly capable of copulating with a head, but equally he can copulate without a head. It is obsolete in mating and he can mate for eight hours without a head. But that, that will be his last mating though. Um, and we've also worked with some alpine grasshoppers like these. Um, they're very charismatic and what's intriguing about them is that they can change color. So usually under, in, under low temperature they're sort of more brown, a darker color and when they warm up within minutes they turn into this beautiful turquoise color. And we ask questions about um, how this color is changed, the mechanism and also what the function is. What, what are they changing color for? So these are just some of examples of um, study animals that I've worked with. So it's clear I'm not working on model species, I'm not working on fruit flies or worms or mouse or um, zebrafish. And you may now ask me, you know, so what have you discovered about cancer? Well, I've discovered nothing about cancer and it's possibly unlikely that I'll discover something about cancer, but I'm starting to understand my work, my students are starting to understand the biology of these animals 
other people will come along, they'll build on the work that we've started, and there is a potential likelihood that we'll discover something in these animals that are not just curiosities, that are not just interesting from a biological perspective, but that also have a real impact on human life, maybe about um, a medical impact. So if you ask me, oh, I forgot this one. This is the, um, the orchid mantis. This is a praying mantis that we worked with in Malaysia. So we went on field trips to Malaysia. And if you can't quite see it, it's because they look very similar to flowers. And we actually did show that bees mistake them for flowers as well and, and, and approach the mantid and then they just snatch them out of midair and, and grab them. So that was a very fun um, bunch of field trips that we took to Malaysia. Very hard to find. We could only find them by asking our villagers to help us to go out and, and grab them for us. Almost forgot the most exciting one. But if you ask me where we should look in future for biological discoveries, my answer has to be that we have to look everywhere. We can't just close our eyes to the unstudied or understudied because we just don't know what discoveries we may make in the future. And that's my, my summary, my conclusion. It was... Everything in my life seems to be a coincidence. I had to do a third year ecology course at university and uh, in that we had to pick a research mm -hmm. project, a small research project. And of course we were only in third year so they gave us some examples of what we could do. And uh, in that was a spider project and I went, oh yeah, that sounds okay, I'll do that. Um, and so that started me looking at spiders, working with spiders and ever since I have I've continued working with the spiders because every time I answer one question, I end up with five new questions. So it's a never ending process of, of discovering new things, asking more questions. And I always think back at the time when I made the choice because the other potential I could have done in third year was a research on, um, on wood lice, on pill bugs. And I'm thinking now, you know, looking back, if I had chosen that, project in third year, maybe I'll be talking to you about pillbugs. I'll be an expert in pillbugs now and not in spiders. So these things just happen. You just start on something and you discover that's, that's what really interests you. Yes, I'll, I'll welcome you to join my lab and research that <laughs> together with me. It's not an easy, easy answer. Um, on the face of it, it sounds like this sort of behavior is completely aberrant. It's, it's a wrong behavior. Males and females should come together and mate and then separate. There's two ways you can think about it. You can think about it in terms of, does the male actually benefit from that behavior? And it sounds crazy, right? Why would a male benefit from being eaten by a female? But in the Australian redback spider, a male who is cannibalized by the female will fertilize more of her eggs than a male who is not cannibalized by her. And put that together with the high mortality that males suffer from traveling from one female to the next because they're so far apart and the males are tiny, it totally makes sense that the male would invest everything into this one female, get eaten by her and maximize the number of eggs he can fertilize in his lifetime. So here we have an example of cannibalism actually being not an issue for males at all. On the contrary, it's, it's a benefit for the male. On the other hand, when we go back to the St. Andrew's cross spider, the picture I showed you before, this is not a, um, a harmonious event at all. Um, males try to escape from the female. Females uh, aggressively um, pursue the male and wrap him up and eat him. And here we think it's a conflict. Here, females are trying to control copulation by the male, and once they have enough sperm from that male, they just wrap it up, attack him, wrap him up, and eat him. So I think every species probably has a unique story why this behavior is maintained. Same goes with the praying mantids. Um, a male who's eaten by a female, because he's quite large, she will produce many more eggs and he will fertilize 
um, more more eggs with her. Um, but he is also very happy to go on and, and mate with another female if he has a chance. I, I also do student advising, so I usually see um, students as the first start at Macquarie and I talk to them and I, I try to design a program with them that suits their interests. And my advice would always be, if you've identified biology is, a, is something you're interested in, obviously we're going to choose some biology units for you to do in first year. But I always advise to throw in a bit of chemistry, maybe some environmental sciences, a bit of um, um, mathematics or stats, just to give you a, a good rounding, a good background, because you never know, you may discover that in your second semester that chemistry is really what you enjoy, or biochemistry. So you don't want to lock yourself in too early um, with uh, restricting your, your um, study into a too narrow path. And as I said, for myself, you know, it took me quite a while to figure out what I wanted and how I was going to go about it. I was a I was, I was terrible at chemistry, you know, I failed chemistry, I had to do it again. Um, but now, of course, I bring in chemistry with my questions as well, and I regret that I was, um, I was so lame in, in first year, because it's all together, it, it all fits in together. I have to admit, I, I do very little about how it relates to humans um, in terms of human biology or human uh, uh, welfare. Um, I'm very interested in, in the biology of the animal. Um, but there are some intersections. Obviously, um, spider bites are something that affect humans and understanding which particular biology of spiders um, makes it more likely that humans are, are get bitten by the spiders and, and, and how to, to deal with that, I can contribute to. So, for example, redback spiders we know do extremely well in urban environments. Um, they like high temperatures, so that immediately means that any metal sheets or objects they'd like to sit underneath and I can contribute to sort of a, a better awareness of some animals that may have a, a detrimental impact. I can also enrich people's life in terms of looking at spiders when they go through the bush and, and, and gaining an appreciation of, of the spiders. And maybe for some watching them at a distance, others are probably more comfortable getting a bit closer. It was very clear very early on, even in school, that that was the subject I enjoyed the most, I did the best in, and, and for me the decision what to study at university was quite clear, you know, I wanted to study biology, but I didn't know what it meant. I had no idea what a biologist did, what sort of jobs were out there. I had this vague idea of becoming a ranger in a national park, that was the only thing I ever thought about. And look, maybe I was ill-prepared or didn't spend enough time thinking about it, but in retrospect, as I showed in my past, you know, it, one thing just led to the other, just led to the other. And maybe by leaving myself a little bit of openness of where I could go, maybe that's, that worked for me anyway. But it was very clear my life was going to have biology in it. Under different circumstances, maybe I would have become a biology teacher or would have become that ranger. I don't know. Biology. I did uh, general maths. I uh, did geography. Uh, I did chemistry. I did ancient history. I love ancient history. Uh, I think everyone should do it. Uh, particularly Greek mythology. There's so many biological terms that have their origin in Greek mythology. And if you know the stories, the Greek gods are just crazy, crazy people. But it kind of puts your biology into into a perspective of where this word comes from. Um, and then I also did German, and I think that was just to bump up my marks because, you know, I'm an original uh, native speaker, so that helped me. Bye, thanks very much. <laughs>